Easter Sunday, 1945, for the U.S. forces off the coast of Okinawa, it is L-Day. The L stands for landing, and it will be the largest joint amphibious assault mounted during World War II in the Pacific Theater. Over 1,000 ships and half a million troops. Like the invasions of Tarawa and Saipan, U.S. forces expect the Japanese to defend the beaches fiercely. To weaken the Japanese defenses, a fire support force of 10 battleships, nine cruisers, 23 destroyers, and 177 gunboats fire on the beaches. At 0745, carrier-based aircraft bomb the beaches and nearby Japanese trenches. 30 minutes later, landing craft begin moving toward the beaches. The supporting fire intensifies until minutes before the first wave lands. The anxious Americans expect fire from the Japanese, but there is none. As the heavy fire lifts, the silence is only broken by the muffled concussion of rounds impacting farther inland. The beaches are empty, except for American soldiers and Marines rushing ashore. Within the first hour, more than 16,000 troops come ashore. By 1000 hours, U.S. troops have secured both Yontan and Kadena airfields. Planners had estimated that it would take several days of hard fighting to achieve these two objectives. Instead, it has taken a little over an hour. By nightfall, more than 60,000 U.S. troops are on Okinawa. Operation Iceberg is going better than planned, except for one mystery, the absence of Japanese defenders. Instead of Japanese soldiers, U.S. troops encounter only civilians. The Okinawans inform the Americans that the Japanese army is out there somewhere. The invasion of Okinawa was the culmination of three years of operations in the Pacific against Imperial Japan. In March 1942, the newly formed British and U.S. Combined Chiefs of Staff issued a directive designating the Pacific Theater as an area of U.S. strategic responsibility. The U.S. Joint Chiefs later divided the Pacific Theater into four areas of operation the Central Pacific, the Southwest Pacific, the South Pacific, and the North Pacific. U.S. planners developed a multi-campaign approach to press the Japanese on two fronts. The plan would enable U.S. forces to gain and maintain control over the logistics bases and sea lines of communication necessary to support operations across the vast Pacific theater. As General Douglas MacArthur island hopped from the Solomons to the Philippines in the Southwest Pacific, Admiral Chester Nimitz's Central Pacific Forces launched a similar campaign in the Gilbert Islands in November 1943. By the end of 1944, U.S. forces controlled much of the Southwest and Central Pacific. Seizing Okinawa was not always part of the strategic plan for attacking the Japanese Empire. Initially, the Joint War Plans Committee envisioned MacArthur and Nimitz's forces linking up at the island of Formosa. General MacArthur's progress in the Southwest Pacific, however, prompted a reevaluation of this plan. Successes in the European theater of operations in 1944 also affected troop and supply distribution in the Pacific, as ground forces from the states were sent to France. In light of these developments, support for the invasion of Formosa declined, 
and the Joint Chiefs of Staff looked for other options. The Joint Chiefs' continuous assessment of progress in both theaters assisted the overall prioritization of resources and was key to securing Allied victory in World War II. In their assessment, the JCS examined various ways to use forces and capabilities to achieve their desired end state, the final destruction of the Japanese Empire. Current Army doctrine explains that commanders and staffs at all levels continually assess their progress toward a desired end state as part of the operations process. The operations process is the major command and control activities performed during operations and is the Army's framework for organizing and putting command and control into action. It consists of planning, preparing, executing, and assessing the operation. Unlike the other activities, assessment is continuous and occurs throughout the operations process to support decision making. Assessment involves deliberately comparing intended outcomes with actual events to determine the overall effectiveness of force employment. Although there is no single way to conduct an assessment, commanders and staff often follow a six-step process. Step one, develop the assessment approach. Step two, develop the assessment plan. Step three, collect information. Step four, analyze information and intelligence. Step five, communicate feedback and recommendations. And step six, adapt plans or operations. In late September 1944, the lack of additional ground forces for an operation against Formosa precluded it as a viable option for the link-up of General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz's forces. Planners assessed that sufficient forces were available for operations in the Bonin Islands at Iwo Jima and the Ryukyu Islands at Okinawa. On 3 October, as Allied forces advanced across France, the Joint Chiefs made the decision to invade the island of Okinawa. Codenamed Operation Iceberg, this effort became an important step in the campaign to defeat the Japanese Empire. Seizing Okinawa would provide the U.S. with additional air bases, anchorages, and staging areas for the planned invasion of the Japanese mainland. Just one week later, nearly 200 bombers attacked Okinawa. The war had come to the Ryukyus. The Ryukyus are an island chain extending southwest from Japan to Formosa. The largest island in the chain, Okinawa, offered the Allies yet another staging base for the final assault on Japan. As U.S. forces advanced across the Pacific toward the Ryukyus, their knowledge of the islands and the enemy situation remained incomplete. U.S. forces acquired limited intelligence from Japanese prisoners of war, interviews with former inhabitants of the Ryukyus, and through aerial reconnaissance. Unfortunately, this intelligence was often inadequate, particularly for terrain analysis and estimating enemy composition, disposition, and strength. Current Army doctrine explains that the commander plays a critical role in the intelligence process. The intelligence process generates information, products, and knowledge about an operational environment during planning, preparation, execution, and assessment. An operational environment, or OE, is a composite of the conditions, circumstances, and influences that affect the employment of capabilities and bear on the decisions of the commander. In preparation for Operation Iceberg, U.S. commanders analyzed the mission variables of enemy, terrain, weather, and civil considerations to determine their potential effect on operations. Today, this process is called Intelligence Preparation of the Battlefield, or IPB and it enables commanders and staffs to take a holistic approach to analyzing the operational environment. The IPB process consists of four steps. Step one, define the operational environment. Step two, 
Describe environmental effects on operations. Step three, evaluate the threat. Step four, determine threat courses of action. Step one, define the OE. Assist the commander in identifying relative aspects of the environment in time and space. This is especially important when considering the multi-domain characteristics of an OE. In doing this, they consider how capabilities employed or originating in one domain or the information environment may impact variables, including enemy forces, in other domains. This aids the commander in identifying decisive points upon which to converge effects. A decisive point is key terrain, a key event, a critical factor, or function that, when acted upon, enables a commander to gain a marked advantage over an enemy or contributes materially to achieving success. Identifying the significant characteristics of the OE is an essential step in the IPB process. Commanders and staff use the PMESI PT framework to understand the operational variables and the relationships between them. When conducting a PMESI PT analysis, leaders identify the prominent political, military, economic, social, information, infrastructure, physical environment, and time components of the OE. Commanders and staff then use A-scope to assess civil considerations and examine how areas, structures, capabilities, organizations, people, and events that are important to a society can affect the mission. Commanders and staff may build a crosswalk to visualize the relationship between the operational variables and the civil considerations. In planning Operation Iceberg, U.S. commanders considered the economy and the areas of the island in their assessment. On Okinawa, most of the island's 435,000 inhabitants subsisted on small-scale agriculture. The southern part was almost entirely cultivated and contained three-fourths of the island's population. U.S. commanders used this information about the island's terrain and land use to help define the operational environment. For step two of the IPB, describe environmental effects on operations, the intelligence staff describes how the terrain, weather, and civil considerations may affect friendly operations, enemy forces, and the local population. For Operation Iceberg, the target map prepared by American intelligence represented all that was known of the terrain and Japanese defenses on Okinawa. This incomplete map was based on aerial reconnaissance obtained in the fall of 1944, six months before the planned invasion. To make up for the lack of imagery, the Navy sent a submarine to take photographs of Okinawa's beaches. The USS Swordfish, under Commander K.E. Montrose, left Pearl Harbor on 22 December 1944. Three weeks later, the Navy lost contact with the Swordfish. What U.S. commanders did know about Okinawa was that the island was a mix of complex terrain. Divided by the narrow Ishikawa Isthmus, the island's terrain differs greatly between north and south. The terrain in the north is rugged and mountainous. Southern Okinawa is a combination of limestone ridges and fertile valleys. When U.S. troops advanced from the beaches on El Day, they found nearly every acre of arable land cut into small fields. Planners assessed that the most critical terrain for the operation would be in the south. The purpose of step three, evaluate the threat, is to understand how a threat can affect friendly operations. Although threat forces may conform to some of the fundamental principles of warfare that guide army operations, these forces will have obvious as well as subtle differences in how they approach situations and solve problems. Understanding these differences is essential to understanding how an enemy force will react in a given situation. As U.S. forces approached Okinawa, the Japanese accelerated their defensive preparations. U.S. planners initially estimated that over 48,000 Japanese troops would defend Okinawa. They later raised the estimate to 55,000 and expected the Japanese would reinforce the garrison, increasing its strength to 66,000 by 1 April. 
In reality, the Japanese had prepared to defend the island with far more. Formed in March 1944, the 32nd Army, commanded by General Mitsuru Ushijima, was created to defend Okinawa. Its major subordinate units were the 24th Division, a heavy division with organic artillery and three infantry regiments, the 62nd Division, a light division with two brigades, but no artillery, the 44th Independent Mixed Brigade, and the 27th Tank Regiment. Additional forces, such as sailors and engineers, brought the number to 77,000. Another 20,000 conscripted Okinawa Home Guards and 750 middle school students increased the number of defenders to well beyond 100,000. During step four, determine threat courses of action, the intelligence staff identifies and develops possible threat courses of action, or COAs, that can affect the friendly mission. At a minimum, the staff identifies the most likely enemy course of action and the most dangerous course of action. To be valid, threat COAs should be feasible, acceptable, suitable, distinguishable, and complete. These COAs are then used to assist in developing and selecting friendly courses of action during the military decision-making process. Based on their experiences on Guadalcanal and Saipan, U.S. commanders estimated that the Japanese would aggressively defend the landing beaches and nearby airfields. They also expected a defense in depth, similar to the defenses at Peleliu and Iwo Jima. These earlier island campaigns had been bloody. Now, U.S. commanders had to prepare their forces for what they believed would be an even more intense fight for Japan's fifth largest island. Admiral Chester Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief Pacific Ocean Areas, tasked Admiral Raymond Spruance, the commander of 5th Fleet and the Central Pacific Task Force, with planning and executing the first phase of Operation Iceberg. Admiral Spruance organized his fleet into two task forces. Task Force 50, which he personally commanded, consisted of two carrier strike groups, a British carrier strike group, Task Force 57, and an American fast carrier strike group, Task Force 58. Task Force 50 was a covering force intended to provide the air, surface, and subsurface protection necessary to establish the maritime and air superiority needed to conduct the amphibious assault. The largest part of Admiral Spruance's command was Task Force 51, the Joint Expeditionary Force. Commanded by Vice Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner, this joint task force was responsible for seizing Okinawa and other islands in the Ryukyu chain. Task Force 51 was comprised of various Army, Navy, and Marine Corps forces organized into subordinate task forces. Task Group 51.2, the demonstration group, was an amphibious task force responsible for conducting an amphibious demonstration with the 2nd Marine Division. Task Group 51.3 served as the floating reserve and could only be committed with Admiral Nimitz's approval. Task Force 52 the amphibious support force consisted of the logistics craft to support the landings. It also controlled the Western Islands Attack Group and its landing force, the 77th Infantry Division. An attack group is a subordinate task organization formed for operations in widely separated landing areas. The attack group is composed of units designated to transport, protect, land, and initially support a landing group. Task Force 53, the Northern Attack Force, was responsible for the Northern Beach Sector and consisted of the Marine 3rd Amphibious Corps and its associated logistics and support ships. Task Force 54, the Gunfire and Covering Force, or in today's terms, the Surface Fire Support Group, 
provided surface fire support for the landings and subsequent operations ashore. Task Force 55, the Southern Attack Force, was an amphibious task force charged with executing the main amphibious assault by landing the Army's 24th Corps on the Southern Beach Sector. Task Force 56, commanded by U.S. Army Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner, Jr., was formed around the 10th Army and tasked with assuming operational control, or OPCON, of all land forces once the amphibious assault was complete. Activated in June 1944, 10th Army included both 3rd Amphibious Corps and 24th Corps, as well as its Tactical Air Force, which functioned as the Joint Force Air Component Command, or JFAC. Buckner also controlled the Naval Forces Ryukyus, which served as the Joint Force Maritime Component Command, or JIFMIC, to control and protect the sea lines of communication around Okinawa. Although a thoroughly integrated Joint Force, 10th Army functioned as both the Joint Task Force Headquarters and the Joint Force Land Component Command, or JFLIC, placing considerable demands on Lieutenant General Buckner. Thankfully, Buckner was aided by two seasoned Corps commanders. Major General John R. Hodge commanded 24th Corps, which consisted of the 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions. Hodge was a veteran leader of Guadalcanal, New Georgia, Bougainville, and Leyte. 3rd Amphibious Corps, commanded by Major General Roy Geiger, consisted of the reinforced 1st and 6th Marine Divisions. Geiger had led operations on both Bougainville and Guam. While 10th Army had never directed a campaign, its corps and divisions had all been combat tested before the invasion of Okinawa. Rounding out Task Force 56 was the Army's 77th Infantry Division, commanded by Major General Andrew D. Bruce, and two divisions in floating reserve, the Army's 27th Infantry Division, under Major General George W. Greiner, and the Marine 2nd Division under Major General Thomas E. Watson. In all, 10th Army marshaled approximately 183,000 service members. Of these, 116,000 troops were scheduled to land on 1 April 1945. The invasion of Okinawa was the largest standalone U.S. amphibious operation of World War II, rivaled only by the D-Day invasion of Normandy in June 1944. Learning from earlier campaigns, U.S. commanders realized that gaining and maintaining access to a denied area of operations required overwhelming combat power, thorough integration across the services, and overall unity of effort. These previous island invasions occurred against remote islands farther away from Japan. Okinawa would be the first operation against a Japanese home island. Planning this impressive operation would require extensive coordination, cooperation, and unity of command between all three services. These principles remain an important element of joint doctrine today. Joint force commanders organize their forces in a manner that enhances inter-service cooperation while maintaining unity of command. A combatant commander establishes a joint task force, or JTF, in response to a Secretary of Defense approved military operation, a crisis, or a planned contingency in support of a designated O-Plan. A JTF is established when the scope, complexity, or other factors require capabilities from multiple services operating under a single Joint Force Commander. The combatant commander provides the mission, designates forces, delegates command authorities and relationships, and assigns the JTF with a Joint Operations Area, or JOA. The JTF commander can organize the JTF with service components, functional components, or a combination of both based on the nature of the mission and the operational environment. The JTF commander normally establishes functional component commands to control military operations, 
but a joint force always contains service components to provide administrative and logistic support. The JTF commander exercises operational control, or OPCON, over all assigned and attached forces. OPCON includes authoritative direction over all aspects of military operations and joint training necessary to accomplish missions assigned to the command. The authority for these latter aspects, known as Administrative Control, or ADCON, is typically provided by the respective service components and, for Army forces assigned to a joint task force, is exercised through the R4. The R4 is the Army component and senior Army headquarters of all Army forces assigned or attached to a Combatant Command, Subordinate Joint Force Command, Joint Functional Command, or Multinational Command. Since the preferred approach to establishing a JTF headquarters is to use an existing service headquarters, the JTF commander, if an Army headquarters, retains all responsibilities associated with both headquarters, the R4 and JTF. However, this can overload the JTF headquarters, and generally, an Army headquarters that transitions to a JTF headquarters designates a subordinate Army commander as the Deputy R4 Commander for performing those duties. The designated commander and staff then work through the Theater Army Commander to provide administrative and logistic support to all Army forces in the JOA and to coordinate Army support to other services as required by the JTF Establishing Authority. The JFLIC normally exercises OPCON of same service forces. However, they will typically be delegated tactical control, or TACON, of other services forces. TACON is a command authority over assigned or attached forces that is limited to the detailed direction and control of movements or maneuvers within the operational area necessary to accomplish missions or tasks assigned by the commander. Like the JFLIC, a Joint Force Maritime Component Command, or JIFMIC, charged with planning an amphibious assault designates command relationships that promote cooperation and maintain a clear unity of command. To facilitate unity of command, forces conducting an amphibious operation are typically organized into an amphibious task force and a landing force under a common commander. The landing force may consist of U.S. Army or Marine Corps forces organized into embarkation groups, units, elements, and teams while the amphibious task force consists of Navy vessels and sailors organized into corresponding groups, units, elements, and ships. A successful amphibious assault requires coordination across each echelon. To promote cooperation, the Joint Force Commander will designate command support relationships by phase between the amphibious task force and the landing force. This relationship is appropriate when one organization should aid, protect, complement, or sustain another force. The designation of the supported and supporting role is important as it conveys priorities to the commanders and staffs who are planning or executing the operation. During the planning phase, the amphibious task force commander and the landing force commander will identify the events and conditions for any changes to the command support relationship throughout the operation. Since the landing force is responsible for the overall execution of operations ashore, command may potentially transfer from the Joint Force Maritime Component Commander to the Joint Force Land Component Commander once ashore. This transfer requires clearly established criteria and careful consideration should be given to the Land Component Commander's ability to provide the necessary command and control and sustainment before a shift occurs. Joint command and control of the forces participating in the invasion of Okinawa generally followed current joint doctrine. Admiral Spruance, as 5th Fleet Commander, functioned as the Joint Task Force Commander and was responsible for the overall operation. Admiral Turner and Task Force 51 functioned as the JIFMIC, retaining total control of the amphibious operation until the beachhead was secure and Lieutenant General Buckner established his command post. Vice Admiral Turner's task force was not only responsible for landing Lieutenant General Buckner's Task Force 56, 
but also for preparing the landing area and providing fire support. Direct naval and air support was furnished by both Task Force 52, the amphibious support force, and Task Force 54, the surface fire support group. These forces prepared the main landing sites. In 1942, Vice Admiral Turner had brought the Marines to Guadalcanal. And now, nearly three years later, he was bringing the 10th Army to Okinawa. Initially, the Joint Chiefs of Staff planned for the invasion to occur on 1 March 1945. But before the invasion of Okinawa could begin, General Douglas MacArthur had to liberate Luzon in the Philippines, and the Navy and Marines had to seize Iwo Jima. The success of these two operations would free up the landing craft and ground forces necessary for Operation Iceberg. When developing their concept of operations, commanders first visualize the decisive operation that directly accomplishes the mission. They then visualize how shaping and sustaining operations support the decisive operation. The decisive operation prioritizes effort and is the focal point around which the plan is developed. A shaping operation is an operation at any echelon that creates and preserves conditions for success of the decisive operation through effects on the enemy, other actors, and the terrain. Shaping operations may occur throughout the area of operations and involve any combination of forces and capabilities across multiple domains. Commanders may designate multiple shaping operations. Key to Operation Iceberg's success was the isolation of Okinawa. Within a week of the Joint Chiefs' directive to seize the island, 5th Fleet began shaping operations with airstrikes against the Ryukyus. On 10 October 1944, Admiral Spruance directed Task Force 58 to destroy airfields and shipping infrastructure across the island chain. Additionally, heavy bombers from the Mariana Islands began making daily raids on Okinawa proper. The Joint Task Force continued to launch carrier-based strikes as part of its shaping operations throughout the winter and early spring of 1945. Just days before L-Day, aircraft from Task Force 58 targeted the Japanese islands of Kyushu, Shikoku, and Honshu. Although the Japanese on Kyushu launched an airstrike that left the USS Franklin in flames, the damage inflicted on the Japanese neutralized the enemy's ability to oppose the landings on Okinawa. By the time of the invasion, Americans had destroyed much of the Japanese aircraft in the Ryukyus and reduced the air threat from Kyushu and Formosa. Along with dropping bombs on Okinawa, 5th Fleet also dropped leaflets. In an effort to weaken the enemy's will to resist, and persuade civilians to accept the Americans' presence, U.S. intelligence agencies prepared over five million leaflets to be dropped on Okinawa. Although planners expected an intense fight for the island, they attempted a targeted military information support operation to influence the Japanese defenders to either desert or quickly surrender. Vice Admiral Turner also planned a deception operation to confuse the Japanese 32nd Army as to the actual location and strength of the main landing force. For this, he chose Task Group 51.2, the demonstration group. Just as its name suggests, this amphibious task force was responsible for conducting an amphibious demonstration with the 2nd Marine Division. While the main effort landed on the west coast, the 2nd Marines executed a simulated landing on the opposite side of the island. Turner intended this action to deceive the enemy into believing that the landings would be made there as well as on the Hagashi beaches. To simulate an actual assault, landing craft and amphibious tractors under a smoke screen carried Marines toward the rocky and almost non-existent beaches near Minatagawa. 
At 0830, H hour for the main assault, all boats reversed course. The Marines repeated the demonstration the next day, then joined the rest of 10th Army. In addition to the deception operation, U.S. forces needed to seize the Karama Islands to the west of Okinawa to set conditions for the invasion. Not only would this complete the isolation of Okinawa, it would also provide deep water anchorages and serve as a logistics base to sustain the wider operation. Admiral Turner ordered the Western Islands Attack Group and its landing force, the 77th Infantry Division, to seize the islands. Within three days of landing, the islands were under U.S. control and the division secured its main objectives, sheltered harbors that could be used to refit, resupply, and repair naval vessels. The Karama Islands would play a vital role as the logistics hub for sustaining operations required to support a lengthy and resource-intensive joint operation. Sustaining operations enable the decisive operation or shaping operations by generating and maintaining combat power. Sustaining operations focus internally on friendly forces, while decisive and shaping operations focus externally on the enemy or environment. Sustaining operations include personnel and logistics support, support area security, movement control, terrain management, and infrastructure development. Along with isolating Okinawa, Admiral Turner's task force also had to control the airspace and reduce obstacles on the island. During most joint operations, the JFAC exercises airspace control authority. However, during operations where the Joint Force Commander has established an Amphibious Objective Area, or AOA, the Airspace Control Authority may delegate control of specific airspace to the JIFMIC or the Amphibious Task Force Commander. The Navy Tactical Air Control Group then controls air operations in the AOA through the Tactical Air Control Center and coordinates with the JFAC's Air Operations Center for additional support. Whether Airspace Control Authority is exercised by the JIFMIC or the JFAC, close coordination and planning between all component commanders and staff is necessary to synchronize operations across multiple domains and avoid duplication of effort. Plans should usually provide for the rapid seizure of existing airfields, airfield-capable sites, and sites for early warning and air control. This enables the early deployment ashore of aviation elements and extends the radius of warning and control. Air operations, prior to an amphibious assault, are typically conducted to satisfy intelligence requirements and reduce enemy forces and defensive installations in the landing area. During ship-to-shore movement, pre-planned airstrikes assist in creating exploitable gaps within the landing area. Once the amphibious task force is making its final run to the beach, air support, integrated with naval surface fire support, is used to neutralize beaches, landing zones, approach routes, and adjacent key terrain. Much like today, from 28 to 31 March 1945, Navy and Army commanders closely coordinated air missions with 10th Army's planned ground operations. Based on limited reconnaissance, Lieutenant General Buckner requested that aircraft again concentrate on potential enemy positions in southern Okinawa. With these operations complete, Vice Admiral Turner's Joint Task Force was ready to begin the invasion of Okinawa. Current Army doctrine explains that Joint Force Commanders require Army units that can defeat the enemy and dominate land portions of the Joint Operations Area. Winning in this environment requires the Theater Army to set the theater and assist Army forces in the fight. However, when a combatant commander determines command and control requirements are beyond the capabilities of a Theater Army or Corps Headquarters, the Army may constitute a Field Army. For Operation Iceberg, the senior army echelon was a field army, not a theater army. The field army's ability to command and control multi-core operations is what distinguishes it from other echelons. This function is vital to the joint and multinational forces' ability to prevail in large-scale combat operations, 
and is central to the field army's ability to perform the R4 role and serve as a J-Flick. As a field army and J-Flick, 10th Army not only had to command and control two corps in large-scale combat, but was also responsible for managing airspace, coordinating operational level sustainment, and integrating joint fires. Operation Iceberg occurred in three phases. Phase one began six days before the main assault with supporting landings on nearby islands. Phase one concluded with the main landing on Okinawa, the seizure of the airfields, and the demonstration in the south. Phase two included the seizure of Ieshima in the north and the occupation of northern Okinawa. Phase three involved the seizure of other nearby islands. Once phase one was complete and 10th Army established a secure beachhead, Lieutenant General Buckner's headquarters transitioned from the JFLIC to a joint task force and assumed total responsibility for the Rukus. Buckner set conditions for his Corps' success by establishing systems and processes for integrating joint capabilities across domains. To integrate multi-domain fires, Buckner insisted that Corps and Division commanders use their fire support elements to coordinate naval gunfire, air support, and artillery. These fire support elements would then collect, prioritize, and disseminate data on targets suitable for attack, and then conduct post-strike assessments to determine the munitions effects and the battle damage incurred. Requests for external fire support were screened and prioritized as they passed through the various echelons fire support elements for approval. At echelons above division, the fire support coordinator, or FISCORD, works closely with the respective Air Operations Center, Battlefield Coordination Detachment, and other unified action partners to deliver timely and accurate cross-domain and multi-domain fires. Multi-domain fires are fires that converge effects from two or more domains against a target. Surface-based fires converged with other effects across domains create multiple dilemmas, taxing the enemy's ability to effectively respond. Lieutenant General Buckner also worked closely with his Corps commanders to outline his intent for them as tactical formations maneuvering subordinate divisions. As was also true during World War II, Large-scale combat operations require a core headquarters to function as a tactical formation under a land component command or subordinate to a field army. The core commander synchronizes the employment of joint capabilities in conjunction with army decisive action. Core operations shape an OE and set the conditions for tactical actions by the division and lower echelons. In large-scale combat operations, the Corps task organizes and maneuvers divisions to destroy enemy land forces, seize key terrain, and dominate the land portion of the Joint Operations Area. The characteristics distinguishing Corps operations from those of the division are scope and scale. The Corps focuses on shaping conditions for its divisions by use of its assets, enablers, and leveraging joint capabilities. The ability to execute deliberate and dynamic targeting is a critical capability of the Corps, as is the ability to comply with the theater airspace control plan. Today, the division is the Army's principal tactical warfighting formation during large-scale combat operations. When serving as a tactical formation, divisions conduct battles and engagements as part of a larger campaign under the control of a Corps. A division commander employs brigade combat teams with aviation, fires, intelligence, and joint capabilities as part of a combined arms approach during operations. Joint capabilities coordinated through the Corps are enablers for the division, allowing the division commander to shape conditions for subordinate brigades and weight the decisive operation or main effort. 10th Army's decisive operation was 24th Corps' attack to defeat the Japanese 32nd Army in southern Okinawa. In the initial phase of the attack, 24th Corps had OTCON of the 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions. Its immediate tasks were to land south of Hagashi, secure Kadena Airfield, coordinate their advance with 3rd Amphibious Corps maneuver elements, and 
protect 10th Army's southern flank. Third Amphibious Corps' responsibilities mirrored those of 24th Corps. It was to land north of Hagashi, secure Yontan Airfield, and coordinate with 24th Corps while protecting 10th Army's northern flank. Once it achieved its L Day objectives, the Corps would commence Phase 2 of the operation and clear northern Okinawa. But first, 10th Army had to assault the Hagashi beaches, where Buckner and his staff believed the Japanese 32nd Army was waiting. The northern and southern attack forces arrived off the west coast of Okinawa early on 1 April 1945. The day was bright and cool, approximately 75 degrees Fahrenheit. With no surf on the beaches, more favorable conditions could hardly be imagined. Third Amphibious Corps landed with the 1st and 6th Marine Divisions. 24th Corps landed with the 7th and 96th Infantry Divisions. The 6th Marine Division was to capture Yantan Airfield first and then advance to the Ishikawa Isthmus to secure the beachhead in the north by L plus 15. The 1st Marine Division was to advance across the island to the east coast, cutting the island in two. South of the Corps boundary, the 7th Division was to seize Cadena Airfield and then advance to the east coast as well. The 96th was tasked with capturing the high ground above the beaches before moving along the coastal road to secure the beachhead in the south by L plus 10. U.S. commanders expected all of this to take several days, but both corps had achieved their objectives in only a few hours. Before darkness fell on L day, 10th Army had secured the Hagashi beaches, captured both airfields, and expanded the beachhead. As the Americans landed, the Japanese laid in wait along heavily fortified defensive lines in southern Okinawa. Rather than meet the Americans on or near the beaches, General Yushijima planned to draw U.S. forces into well-prepared engagement areas farther inland. On both Peleliu and Iwo Jima, the Japanese defenders had used caves and tunnels in their defenses. Similar to Okinawa, these defenses remained largely untouched by U.S. naval gunfire and airstrikes. The island's caves and ridges greatly enhanced survivability and provided excellent observation and fields of fire for the defenders. On Okinawa, the limestone and coral, reinforced with concrete and wood, produced strong, almost impenetrable defenses that required attacking U.S. forces to develop new tactics and weapons to defeat them. The Japanese 32nd Army also constructed a complex tunnel system throughout the southern half of the island. This Naha Shuri Yonabaru Line, later known simply as the Shuri Line, was where the bulk of the 32nd Army awaited the American attack. As U.S. soldiers advanced south in the week following L Day, they eventually ran into the heavily fortified Japanese positions of Yushijima's first defensive line at Kakazu Ridge. The Americans' rapid advance and sweeping gains on Okinawa had come to an end, and the hard fight was about to begin.
beat off attack after attack. They couldn't stop us now.